If you found out there was a monster called Predator X, what would you think of? Someone shrouded in mystery? Or a member of the X-Men team? Actually, it's a bit off the mark. Predator X, aka Pliosaurus funci, is a species of extinct marine reptile from the Plesiosaurus order that lived on our planet 147 million years ago. At about 40 feet long, Predator X was one of the largest predators of its time. It had an enormous skull, about six and a half feet long. Can you imagine this head? And it wasn't just about the size. The Predator had a powerful bite, four times stronger than that of T-Rex. At least that's what some researchers believe. Although there's not much data on Predator X. Most likely it bit so hard that it could crush rocks and would even crush a passenger car if it found it in the ancient ocean. The problem is that the tales of a terrifying ancient predator usually spread faster than actual science catches up with them. Paleontologists don't even know what the creature's full skull looked like. The bones that scientists have are not enough to paint a complete picture. That is, Predator X was definitely huge and terrifying, but it's still difficult to describe it in detail. What we know is that members of this species had short necks, tear-shaped bodies, and four large paddle-shaped limbs that allowed the predators to fly through the water. The large size meant that an adult Predator X was capable of taking down almost any prey, from marine reptiles to giant fish. In 2006, when Predator X was found on Svalbard, scientists discovered other skeletons as well. They just didn't discover a new species, but an entire ecosystem. And judging from these finds, the ancient Arctic Sea was teeming with formidable predators. I mean, don't get me wrong, there are plenty of dangerous creatures in the ocean today, but in ancient times, the ocean was way scarier. Its waters were dominated by big marine reptiles, which fought each other fiercely and hunted unsuspecting creatures. These giant predators cruised the oceans from pole to pole. Today, they're replaced by whales, dolphins, porpoises, seals, and even sharks. But back then? Back then, the ocean was the realm of reptiles. Fortunately for us humans, there are very few marine reptiles in today's world. Sea crocodiles, turtles, and sea snakes are rarely found in coastal waters. Most of the terrifying creatures went extinct millions of years ago. And you don't have to fear that your boat will be bitten in half by a huge swimming reptile. The only disturbing thing is that we still don't know what other creatures lurk in the depths. By the way, sea reptiles weren't the only scary thing in the ancient ocean. Its waters were also inhabited by giant fish that could even hunt pterosaurs. In Bavaria, in southern Germany, 120 million year old fossils were discovered. They didn't belong to one animal, they painted an entire scene. An armored fish attacking a pterosaur. Scientists have even recreated what happened based on the analysis of fossil remains and believe that the pterosaur was flying over the water looking for fish. But just as it was getting close to grab its prey, the Aspidor hynchus fish attacked it. It grabbed the pterosaur by the left wing and dragged it underwater. Actually, the researchers don't believe that pterosaurs were a regular part of the diet of these fish, although it's too early to come to definite conclusions. There is some evidence which shows hunting pterosaur was a huge mistake on the part of the fish. The fish managed to snatch the pterosaur with its densely spaced teeth, but could not unclench its jaw or swallow the prey whole, because the pterosaur's rigid, leathery wings simply got stuck in between its teeth, like gum. After struggling with the pterosaur for some time, the fish probably suffocated and died. There's only one good thing about this situation. The scientists got a great fossil. Yes, a gruesome death of an ancient animal always makes a paleontologist happy. Actually, fish often overestimate themselves, even today. All because fish are, shall we say, not very bright creatures? People regularly find fish that died just because their lunch was too big for them to handle. One such story happened in 2018. During a morning walk in New South Wales, Australia, a fisherman found a giant flathead in shallow water that had choked on a bream that was too big. The gigantic flathead was about 3 feet long and weighed at least 22 pounds. But even that size was not enough to swallow an 18-inch long bream. Apparently, the fish got stuck in the throat and blocked the access to oxygen. Well, the outcome's pretty obvious. But let's leave the sea creatures alone and talk about, let's say, birds. The Forester hakos is one of the most mysterious extinct animals known to science. For a long time, the creature was thought to be from 24 to 35 inches tall, until a bird skull was found in 2006, 
which is now considered the largest bird skull ever discovered. The beak was about 18 inches long and had a big hook at its end. It belonged to a creature that was probably up to 10 feet tall, almost twice the height as an average adult man. Even the most common cockatoo can bite your finger off. Now imagine what an ancient bird with such a huge beak was capable of. The Porosaurhacos had a strong neck, specially designed for repeated strikes. Their neck muscles were incredibly strong and allowed them to drive their hooked beak into the body of their prey with tremendous force, making them capable of killing small animals. Using its legs, the bird wounded and held its prey while its large, sharp beak served as a blade that could damage vital organs. The most impressive thing about the Forosurhacos is that it's thought to have been strong enough to crack the skulls of its prey using the beak alone. Perhaps predatory mammals chose forests as their habitat just to avoid encountering these aggressive birds on the open plains. Because Forosurhacos not only killed its opponents in a couple of blows, it could also run fast. Scientists speculate that these birds were extremely quick and could reach speeds of up to 30 miles per hour. Although many researchers assume that Forosurhacos mostly fed on small animals the size of rabbits, the structure of their skull seems to hint that they preferred larger prey. Good thing Forosurhacos didn't have teeth. By the way, have you ever wondered why birds lost their teeth in the first place? Teeth seem like a useful thing to have. Scientists also got curious about that and it looks like a recent study helped them get closer to figuring it out. How do you envision a missing link between a velociraptor and a seagull? A flying dinosaur stealing other people's sandwiches. Ichthyornis dispar is one of these missing links. It lived in Kansas back when it was an inland sea, that is, between 100 and 66 million years ago. The animal looked like a seabird, like a gull or a tern. But this creature had two things that modern gulls don't, teeth and a muscular jaw to use those teeth. All this allowed the bird to fly, pick out fish and shellfish, throw them in its mouth, chew them up, and then swallow them. The upper part of the beak was in motion while the rest of the skull remained still. But what happened then? How did the birds lose their teeth? Well, it looks like they just got smarter. Modern birds have a relatively large brain compared to their velociraptor ancestors. Over the course of evolution, birds got smarter. Their brains got bigger and the shape of their skulls changed because that brain needed some room. To make room for the larger brain and change the shape of the skull, the birds had to sacrifice the muscles responsible for chewing. There wasn't enough space for them. And if you can't chew, you don't need teeth. Another researcher offers a different perspective on bird teeth. Birds may have abandoned them to speed up egg hatching. Compared to the incubation period of several months for dinosaur eggs, modern birds hatch in just a few days. Well, some take a few weeks at most. This is because there's no need to wait for the embryo to develop teeth, a process that can take 60% of the incubation time. While in the egg, the embryo is vulnerable to predators and natural disasters, and faster hatching increases the chances of survival. So it's either having teeth or making sure that you won't be eaten right along with the egg. Admittedly, this hypothesis is inconsistent with the fact that turtles don't have teeth, though baby turtles have a very long incubation period. Nutrition might also be the reason. Yes, Steve also found another theory. Early bird species were mostly carnivorous, feeding on insects or small mammals. They used their sharp claws or beaks to tear flesh and break bones. You have to admit, it's hard to swallow something like this without using teeth. Over time, however, many modern species have switched to an omnivorous diet that includes fruits or seeds, which don't require chewing and therefore don't require teeth. Well, as for the birds that eat fish, well, I'll come back to that in a bit. Although birds lost their ability to form teeth more than 65 million years ago, the Pelagornithids family has found a way around that. These gigantic birds with wingspans of 16 to 20 feet grew so-called pseudo-teeth. Unlike real teeth, which are made of enamel and dentine and are located in sockets, these hollow projections were formed directly from bone. These pseudo-teeth were arranged in such a way to look like a menacing, spiky grin, perfect for grasping and holding prey. Pelagornithids were so successful that they were the dominant seabirds in most oceans for most of the Cainozoic, that is the era we live in now. They missed modern humans by a tiny measure of time. The last known Pelagornithids were contemporaries of Homo habilis. Modern birds, on the other hand, have no teeth at all. When they eat, they either swallow the prey whole or cut it into pieces with a sharp beak. However, there are exceptions to the rules. 
For example, geese have pointed serrations in their beak that look and even function like teeth but are not actually teeth. The serrations are made of cartilage and are part of the beak and tongue, not the enamel. They allow geese to grind tough food more efficiently. Penguins also have similar structures consisting of soft keratin spikes on the tongue and palate. Penguins use these spikes when eating slippery fish to make sure it doesn't slip away from their beaks. Toucans also have these structures. The serrations on the sides of their beaks give them an intimidating look when the birds fight each other. By the way, these very serrations on the toucan's beak originally led naturalists to believe these birds were carnivorous, but toucans eat fruit, occasionally adding insects, snakes, lizards, and the like to their diet. No one would develop additional adaptations just to spice up their menu. But back to the creatures that are now extinct. Fortunately for all of us, you've probably heard stories about bloodthirsty piranhas ready to tear apart any living creature that falls into the water. While this is just a myth, 8 to 10 million years ago there was a mega piranha on our planet. It grew to 28 inches long and weighed up to 22 pounds. That is, it was four times as big as modern piranhas. But size is not all that matters, even by the most conservative estimates. The bite force of this creature was four times greater than that of the largest modern piranha. Judging by the tests, mega piranha's teeth were strong enough to bite through the thick outer layer of bovine femur, turtle shell, and even the armor of certain catfish species. This indicates that mega piranha could in theory eat animals with a hard shell, as well as some mammals. Apparently, they've got the shape of their teeth to thank for that. Mega piranhas were a kind of transitional species and their teeth could not only cut and tear like modern piranhas, but also crush, which means their prey stood no chance at all. Experts have concluded that the mega piranha has a greater bite force than many other animals, including extinct mega predators. Some even say that if someone shrunk a T-Rex to the size of a mega piranha, its bite force would be less than what this giant fish can generate with its jaws. Actually, it's understandable why its descendants still know how to bite properly. Research shows that modern black piranha can produce a bite force of 320 newtons. That is, it bites harder than any bone or cartilaginous fish ever recorded to date. Relative to its size, of course, a piranha's bite force is 30 times its weight. This bite is stronger than that of the American alligator. If, of course, one assumes that the alligator would shrink to the size of a piranha. This means that when provoked, this little fish can easily bite through steel bars and damage Kevlar fishing nets when caught in them. There is, however, other data. Shark researchers have documented a record-setting bite in the waters near Mayor Island, New Zealand, and it was delivered by a mako shark. To measure the force of the bite, scientists used a special device attached to the end of a long rod lowered into the water. At first, the bites were relatively weak, but quickly grew in strength as the predator got excited. Eventually, it was recorded that the shark was able to produce an impressive bite force of around 13,000 newtons. This is far more than other species, including the fearsome great white sharks. Their bite force is only 10,000 newtons. The saltwater crocodile beats all competitors, though. It bites with a force of 17,000 newtons. But what about our own ancestors, or distant great-great-grandparents? In 1935, a German anthropologist traveling across Hong Kong walked into a traditional Chinese medicine store and saw unusual divination bones that were used in traditional medicine. Intrigued, he purchased them for further study. Upon closer examination, it turned out these were the teeth of a giant ape species, later dubbed Gigantopithecus. This is how mankind first learned about the giant primates that inhabited our planet millions of years ago. Gigantopithecus was pretty damn big. Based on the fossils, it was 10 feet tall and weighed 1,100 pounds. Traditionally, Gigantopithecus is pictured as a massive gorilla-like ape with thick fur and long arms. Based on the size of its jaws, we can estimate the volume of its brain. It must have been considerably larger than that of a gorilla. This doesn't necessarily mean that Gigantopithecus was smarter than modern gorillas, but still, size matters. Some anthropologists believe that the giant stone tools found in the same layers as the fossils of Gigantopithecus may prove that this species used tools like modern humans. This suggests that Gigantopithecus possessed a certain degree of intelligence and manual dexterity, which cannot be said of other primates of the time. All in all, it seems like everything points to the fact that Gigantopithecus could have turned into a human. 
or rather being similar to humans. They're not our blood relatives after all. But what would this mean for our ancestors? If the Gigantopithecus hadn't gone extinct, it might have been competing with our own species for resources, because primates share roughly the same diet. The Gigantopithecus could even emerge victorious, because when you're an animal, being gigantic is an advantage. You're less vulnerable to predators, and you can cover more ground looking for food. So maybe the Gigantopithecus would have just outcompeted us as a species. Although the size of Gigantopithecus was an advantage, it eventually became its doom. It happened about 100,000 years ago when the climate changed at the beginning of the last Pleistocene Ice Age. The new environment offered fewer fruits and more grasses, roots, and leaves as food sources. Due to their large size, primates were unable to adapt to the new type of food, which led to their extinction. But our ancestors found a way. If Gigantopithecus had been smaller, who knows? It might have made it to modern times. I wonder how our ancestors would have reacted to such rivals. For better or worse, there's no direct evidence that humans ever crossed paths with living Gigantopithecus, but there's an interesting theory that says these primates were so large they had to leave some legacy behind. You can't just live on Earth for a while and then disappear without a trace, not counting teeth and other small finds. This led to the suggestion that Gigantopithecus might have been the inspiration for the legendary Bigfoot. Why not? Big, hairy, looks like a human and a gorilla at the same time? Doesn't it sound like a Bigfoot? Somebody might have seen a skeleton of Gigantopithecus, used his imagination, and now fans of all things supernatural are chasing Bigfoot all over the world. And they're very persistent. Even though there isn't any real evidence for the existence of Bigfoot. I mean, hoaxers of course have collected a whole bunch of evidence, but it's nothing more than fakes. One of the most common proofs is footprints. It makes sense. If Bigfoot exists, it must roam somewhere. However, footprints can easily be faked if you have imagination and know how to work with your hands. Apparently, the hoaxer simply made two large feet out of plaster and attached them to the bottom of his shoes, then walked with very wide strides. Maybe he also jumped up to make the footprints deeper. The result was footprints that were remarkably similar to those a Bigfoot might have left. The thing is, the size and shape of the alleged footprints are very different in various corners of the planet. You have to admit it's unlikely that there are several Bigfoot species on Earth which are hiding from scientists. It's more likely that several people decided to make fake footprints independently from each other. Another type of evidence often used to confirm the existence of Bigfoot is audio or video clips of sounds. Well, it's simple. A couple of video or audio processing programs which even a newbie can master will help you produce unique material. The same goes for the photos. Usually all these Bigfoots are just people in ape suits. The 1967 Patterson-Gimlin film is supposedly one of the most famous proofs of the existence of the elusive creature. This film has been analyzed and discussed for decades, and some people are seriously claiming it proves the existence of Bigfoot. Seriously. They even come up with some arguments. First, when walking, the creature keeps its knees bent rather than holding them straight as humans do. It's typical of all other primates. Second, Bigfoot believers note the rippling motion of the skin and fur that indicate movement, like living flesh. I don't know how you can even make out anything at all in that video. While Hollywood special effects experts are sure that even the technology of that time would have allowed achieving some degree of realism, Bigfoot fans don't let that discourage them. They believe that somewhere on our planet, there's some creature like a miraculously survived Gigantopithecus. Well, Steve and I are not one of those people. And this is the Host's Eagle. And let's be grateful it also went extinct. This bird was native to New Zealand, and as we know, there was a special ecosystem in pre-human times almost free of mammals. There were more than 200 species of birds that filled the food chain on their own. Instead of cows or antelopes, there was a family of flightless birds known as moa. And instead of apex predators such as tigers, New Zealand had the host's eagle. Biologists estimate that host's eagles weighed up to 33 pounds, about 50% more than any raptor known today. In addition, they had a wingspan of only 6 or 10 feet, slightly larger than that of bald eagles. Short wings were probably a necessity for hunting in dense bushes and forests. 
Haas seagulls ate moa. Even though the prey was 15 times larger than the eagles, to handle such large prey, the eagles had powerful beaks to tear the internal organs of the moa and claws similar to that of a tiger. The unfortunate prey would die from loss of blood. Well, you wouldn't wish it on anyone to encounter such a predator. Unfortunately for Haas seagulls, humans appeared in New Zealand around 1280 AD and also began to hunt moa. As time went by, there were more and more humans, and they already presented serious competition to Haas seagulls. By 1400 AD, human hunting was so intense that it caused the moa population to dwindle. The Haas seagulls began to starve, well, and went extinct. It would seem that since the birds couldn't compete with humans, why would we be afraid of them? But let me remind you, Haas seagulls hunted prey that weighed up to 500 pounds. Compared to that, any human is like a light snack. There's further evidence that Haas eagles could be dangerous to humans. The Maori, who lived in New Zealand at the same time as the eagles, have legends that speak of the deadly birds. These birds could swoop from great heights and carry off adults and children. Scientists now believe that these stories refer specifically to the Haas eagles. Thankfully, no eagles are stealing people today. Maybe it's because humans are too dangerous prey, or maybe it's because they're mountain goats. A few years ago, a BBC film crew captured footage of a large golden eagle attacking adult mountain goats and lifting one into the air in its claws, then after soaring up, it would release the goat and let it drop to the rocks below. Not surprisingly, such a blow was fatal for the goat, and it left it with no chance of survival. And the eagle got a pile of meat for dinner, ready to be consumed. This is an unusual behavioral strategy for golden eagles, usually birds of prey hunt baby goats. They're small and inexperienced, which means they're easier to snatch. Meanwhile, adult mountain goats weigh five times more than golden eagles, so the birds have to hunt in pairs. But the result is definitely worth all the effort. Actually, with each new animal in our video today, I increasingly realize just how lucky we all are that they're already extinct and are not trying to eat us. But our ancestors, they had it way harder. And I'm going to give you one more example, in case previous ones didn't seem convincing enough for you. About 350 million years ago, long before the dinosaurs, the planet was very different. Much of the southern hemisphere was covered by the supercontinent Gondwana, which included Africa, South America, Antarctica, Australia, New Zealand, as well as Arabia, Madagascar, and Indian subcontinent. This supercontinent was home to many terrifying creatures that might have made life particularly difficult for our ancient ancestors. One such creature was a giant fish with deadly fangs. This creature, up to 9 feet long, is the largest bony fish in the history of the late Devonian, that is, the period from 383 million to 359 million years ago. And of course, such a big creature was predatory. Imagine a huge predatory fish, which looks like a modern alligator, but with a shorter face. It had rows of small teeth in its mouth, as well as pairs of large fangs that could probably reach two inches. Researchers discovered the first signs of this ancient fish in 1995 when they found a series of isolated fossilized scales. Yes, many discoveries of huge creatures start with tiny details like this. Eventually, scientists were able to piece together a complete skeleton and they discovered that the huge fish was a very, very voracious predator. How can one get that from the skeleton? Well, the researchers looked at the fins, and they appeared to be facing the back of the body, which means the fish could make a sudden spurt to attack its prey. It most likely hunted four-legged creatures, very, very distant ancestors of humans. Eventually, the fish went extinct. This happened about 359 million years ago. And then, a hell of a lot of time later, humans came to be. But just think about it. Animals always competed with humans, even before humans became humans. On the other hand, humans are animals too, so we're also a part of the competition in the wild. See you later.